Hey there friends, welcome to another episode of Flight Chariots The Rise. Guys, allow me to introduce you to Nancy Timms, a fascinating personality whose life has spun an intricate web of cosmic encounters, personal development and a deep devotion to the cause of extraterrestrial disclosure and spiritual awakening. Formerly a steadfast employee of the Department of Defense, Nancy's journey took an unexpected turn when she found herself a lifelong contactee of extraterrestrial beings. What initially seemed like repressed experiences eventually evolved into a transformative understanding of the importance of these beings to her life and, more importantly, to all of humanity. Nancy Timms, who has become a major voice in the field of extraterrestrial discourse, has stepped into the spotlight with an unwavering conviction. It's time for disclosure. Her dedication to this cosmic narrative is not only personal, it has extended to the creation of timefordisclosure.com, a platform designed to foster an open dialogue about extraterrestrial interactions and their profound impact on humanity. She shares her personal encounters, offers insights she has received from beings beyond dimensions and presents her perspective on what these interactions mean for the ongoing evolution of our species. Nancy's work is more than an individual odyssey, it's a collective call to awakening. She challenges the popular notion of abductions and prefers to refer to these experiences as enlightened contacts. In her understanding, these encounters are part of a larger, benevolent interaction with extraterrestrial beings who wish to guide humanity into a new era of cosmic participation. Nancy Timms is a beacon that invites us to rethink our understanding of alien encounters and encourages us to embark on a journey of self-discovery within the vast cosmic fabric that surrounds us. Okay, Nancy, thank you for being my guest today. We already got a short version of your life in the intro, and now we want to go a little bit deeper. I would be happy if you could tell me your story first, and then we can discuss one or the other aspect in more detail. So maybe let's start uh, at the beginning. You worked for the Department of Defense. Tell me more. Yes, I work for the Department of Defense. Um, I worked for them for about eight to nine years, and I uh, applied for a job, and I was a civilian and went to work for the Department of Defense, and they put me with the Army. And I was working in Hawaii at Schofield Barracks, and this particular clinic was a teaching institute. So because of the fact that I was working with commanders, generals, uh, all kinds of officers and soldiers in general, all of us that work in this department had to have a security clearance. And it was a wonderful experience. I got the opportunity to meet these young so soldiers and help prepare them to get ready to be shipped overseas. So they had to be medically and dentally taken care of and fixed so that they could be in overseas deployed for over 24 months and not receive any care. So it was an important thing. And it was, but it had nothing to do with extraterrestrials or interdimensionals or weapons. Um, occasionally I would get a pilot in and I would jokingly say, tell me the truth. Have you ever seen anything odd up in the sky? And they would just kind of look at me because we were all under an oath and we really Jokingly, we could talk about things, but on a serious note, we really weren't allowed to do that kind of thing. So I I didn't push my boundaries that far that, you know, I kept it all in fun. You know, getting dental work done is not fun anyway. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So can you get in more detail about your job? What exactly was your job there? Uh, well, I was a, a dental assistant and I moved around into different departments, learning about all aspects of dentistry. 
Um, being a teacher, and a student, we did everything from orthodontics to oral surgery to periodontics, et cetera. Uh, the main thing that was unique about it was that um, I was privy to seeing some 3D radiograph imaging that most private practices do not have. It's really expensive. And so when I was there, it was brand new and everybody was getting to know it. And, and you could see things on a normal x-ray, If say, for example, a tooth or a bone. When you take the x-ray of it, you'll see really is the outside surface. You can see decay or, or disease or something within the bone, but it's basically the outer structure. And so with this 3D type imaging, you can actually take a tooth or a bone and you can look at it from the inside, not just the outside. You go in from the inside and you can see every nerve, every capillary, everything. So it really broadens the technology as far as medicine and dentistry on what you can, um, you know, what you can learn. And, and, and it changes the whole aspects to being better treatment. Everything about it is better. And what's really strange about this is that at the time it was fascinating and wonderful but where I have used this knowledge is when I saw the um, mummies and the um, Mexico UFO hearings. And what I was watching, I watched it every bit of it completely. And what I was most impressed with was the radiographs that they had of these mummies. And these, these were these type of radiographs, the 3D imaging, where you can go in and see. So... With that type of imaging and technology, they would know immediately if somebody had tried to graft an, something from another type animal and tried to piece together a being and make it appear to be a, an extraterrestrial or interdimensional, whatever this little being was. Um, they were, if I recall, they were 10,000 years old. So in my experiences, I've never seen anything that short or anything like it. But I do know that with the technology that they were using, that they were telling the truth. I mean, you would immediately know if those appendages and things were not of theirs and they were theirs. So I'm, it's funny how everything in my life kind of comes together. You know, it's like I never realize it really at the time. But then later when I look back, I see how all these experiences were kind of like intentional for me, you know, to have these experiences and to be able to speak about these things. Mm -hmm. I have a completely different opinion on these mummies. I saw, yeah. I saw, I saw different um, analysis about them, and they showed that the bones had a had a cut, and they were put together, and there is no joint. So I I think something is fishy with these um, with these mummies, but Everybody has its opinion. That, and that's well, completely I was crazy. looking at the scientific evidence of it from that end. I realized that the man that presented it automatically, that put up red flags and people already formed an opinion. So once their opinion was made, when they put out the scientific facts, if you know what you're looking for and you understand what the radiographs and the images mean, you see it from a whole different perspective and you, you, I, for one, eliminated the fact of what everybody thought of that man, the, the uh, <clears throat> ufologist from Mexico. I can't think of his name, but he sort of has a bad rep for doing things like this. So opinions were made. So you can't judge a book by its cover because those little mummies and the evidence presented are not necessarily representative of him although he was the one that presented it. So I would say people need to do their own research, look at their own facts, look things up. So, you know, cause there's, you, you can't let, you, you would really need to look at things thoroughly before you make your overall opinion. Yeah, absolutely right. Talking about Jaime Mausan, some call him Jamie Mausan. And uh, yeah, he's a bit he of, has a bad rep. <laughs> he has a bad rep. Yeah. Yeah. He's yeah. Uh, bad potato yeah pot. but um it's not about uh, Jaime Mausan today it's about no. your, your story yes. and um 
Now I want to get into the good stuff. So tell me about your transition from a government employee to a lifetime contactee. Oh, uh, really? Neither one played a part, you know, had nothing to do with each other other than it was an experience that I needed and has taught me things uh, that I can utilize for the rest of my life. But I am a lifelong experiencer with positive extraterrestrials and interdimensional beings. And this started when I was, my first recalled memories are around two, three years old, and they would always come and get me. And when I was young, it was all very fun and playful. They have the technology where they can change their image if they want to. They can change the scenery around you. So they can make it as fun as, and playful. And and you don't even realize that you are having an experience with a uh, extraterrestrial or interdimensional because it's it's a learning process and a growth process you, for you as you age. For me, as I got older, I, you know, reading books on my own, uh, seeing things on television, the media, et cetera, all these things, I began to become scared. You know, I began to question, what is this happening to me? You know, so I began to be scared. So <clears throat> I changed from that little playful child having the experiences into this young girl starting to come into her teenage years, being very fearful and afraid to, to get up and walk to the bathroom by myself and just afraid to get up. You know, I was a bedwetter for a while because I was scared to go to the bathroom. There was different things. So I, as I got older, and I did quit wet in the bed, by the way. <laughs> but anyway, um, throughout these things, um, I learned very quickly this was not a topic that you could talk to people about. You know, my parents, occasionally we would have deep conversations, but what my, what they like to talk about was the fact that we think, we feel sure that there's other things out here in life. But as far as me talking about like uh, little entities being in my room and stuff, they were just like, oh, you're having a, a, a dream, go back to bed. You just got a very vivid imagination, all these type of things. So once I realized that this was not a topic that you could talk about at school or with friends or even within family or the rest of the world, more or less, that you wherever you go, I suppressed it. So as I got into my 20s, though, my visitations and experiences became, they started to be more conscious memories. And they would show me their real images. So the feeling that I would feel is so overwhelming. It's hard to express. You really don't know. It's not a feeling that you ever experience. So in your mind, I think we all have a, uh, in our, con in our brain, it tells, it knows when there's something that we don't understand and it puts up these red flags in our mind and we become very fearful. So I would become very fearful and scared, even though in a lot of ways it was okay with me, but the feelings of it, I did not understand because I had never felt things like this before. So they would basically allow me to have my consciousness and experience until I got to that very fearful, overly anxiety, fearful state. And then they would basically tap me out and put me in a subconscious functional fashion to where I was kind of like walking around in a trance and I was still fully functional but I would tend to have more fragmented type memories, which wasn't easy for me because I would have these fragments of memories and it would be hard to understand and piece it all together. So this continued all, all through my 20s. And then when I got into my later 20s and I had, became a mother and had young children and things, um, <clears throat> I decided that, um, well, for one thing, I was more aware of the things that were happening to me and I was 
more conscious of the whole situation. So whenever they would come to where I was, like in my bedroom or wherever, <clears throat> I would feel their presence immediately. I knew. So I would just kind of pull the covers up tight and keep my eyes closely closed and and then I would feel their presence. And then I would feel the covers come down off of me. And then I would feel a vibrational, like a scan vibrational type thing go from my head to my toe, from my toe to my head. And this would go on for a while. So then after this happened, I would start to feel my body as if it, it was floating up. So then I would open my eyes and look around and I would look down and see my bed empty. So this is something that was physically happening to me. And I would look over and I would be holding hands with a gray. And now that I'm older, I understand that this one particular female gray has been with me all my life. She is always who comes to get me and take me to craft or wherever it is that I am intended to go. She is the one and we are bonded together. Um, you know, I didn't ever really understand it when I was young. As I've gotten older, I now understand what they were doing to me is we are in a 3D world and we all have a frequency, but ours is very low. So what they were doing is when they would come in, that vibrational feeling I was feeling is they were changing, changing my vibrational frequency to a higher frequency at, as, uh, to match theirs. And that way, that is how I was physically able to go up through roof or through a window or through a door. And I never understood this until later on in my experiences and with them giving me more conscious memory and kind of answering a lot of the questions that I had. But so when I realized all these things, I decided I meditated and I asked them for more conscious time. And I wanted to know why me, I wanted to know what is the purpose of this? What is this all about? What is it? So, um, I had, they came and got me. I don't remember how soon after I meditated or anything like that, but they came and got me and they took me to a group of what they were. I was told they were a group of elders and these were a group of interdimensional beings of different races and most likely different dimensions. And so I asked them, why is this happening to me? What does this mean? What is the purpose of this? And so they told me that I had made a decision to come here before I became a human into the human experience and that I had chose to be here to assist and help humanity to understand that we are not alone in the world and that this is a pivotal moment and human, for humanity, there's nothing like this has ever happened before. And people like me were needed to be here to assist and help people to understand that all of the misinformation and all of our social media and uh, governments and uh, society around us have fed us with all these false informations to keep us in fear and keep us all separated as a uh, group consciousness or a unity of humanity. And the goal is to, we are supposed to all, we are all connected. We, they have the people in our society that have used us like puppets, keep us at a constant dilemma and keep, they always try to keep us separated because when we're all connected, we are very powerful as one and they do not want that. So they explained to me why I was here and that, that there was an important reason for it and that I agreed. And I said, well, I don't remember any of this. So then they showed me a vision and I saw myself in a etheric being state. And, and I saw them come to me and say, it's time. You are going to go into your human life now. And so, and they told me that when I, 
and born and when I become a human that I would not remember any of this, but they would come and see me later in my life and all these things would be revealed and I would start to remember things. And that's exactly what happened. And that's exactly how I've progressed in, in starting to remember and, and realizing all these things. So I later realized that all the times through my human life and my human life has not been a bed of roses, just like any other human. Um, I've had my ups and downs in life. I've experienced two divorces, very traumatic. Um, I've had all kinds of things happen. And throughout time, when these things happened to me, and I thought it was just the most horrible thing in the world and was traumatized by these things, they would appear to me and say to me, if this experience ever gets to be too much for you, you can always come home. And to be honest with you, all this time they were saying this to me, it didn't resonate with me. It never clicked with me. I just didn't really understand what all these things mean still. So I did not understand. I thought this was my whole life, my only life. And, you know, I'm a mother and now I am a grandmother. So I thought this is well, all the, the, this is it. You know, the, I didn't understand. It didn't click with me. But later on, I have found out that I was an extraterrestrial that made a decision within whichever race I was in, which I do not know, um, to come here. And all of the positive um, interdimensionals and positive extraterrestrials have sent incarnates here for this very reason to help and assist humanity to understand that there are a positive and good group of beings that are here to assist us not to change or fix everything we are here on free will so they look at us like children when we make mistakes we have to suffer the consequences we have to learn from our mistakes so that we don't make the same ones again. Unfortunately, a lot of them we have continued to make over time, but a lot of that is because of the facets of government that control us and our broken religious system and this horrible banking system, all these things keep us separated and in turmoil. So we're at a constant pull. We, we always feel like these things going on in the war, like in the world, like these wars and things are constantly keeping us separated and from keeping us from knowing who we truly are. And I'm talking about not what the world around us has created, but the true inner self of who we are. So I've learned a lot throughout this process. And, you know, I hope I haven't skipped over something that you would like to ask me. So I'll give you the opportunity now to ask me something. Thank you. It was a very interesting story so far. Um, let's go way back when it, okay. to where it started, when you were just a little girl, is what you told me. Um, would you say it all started with feelings, um, intuition, or maybe tender touches of telepathy, um, but, no, but no physical contact or... Oh, it was physical contact. Oh, yeah. All my life, I've had physical contact. I, I, I have sat and run my fingers through theirs. I have touched their skin. They have touched mine. Uh, I have a bond and a love with them that is, I don't even know how to explain to you. Um, I am part them. I know that. We are all a little bit part extraterrestrial. We have been denied our heritage, but they had a part in our creation and they had a part in everything on this planet and they love everything on this planet. We're just a small part of what they love about earth. They see earth as a living being. They see all of our plants and all of our animals are all living beings. Our water is a living being and everything is alive and we're all connected and Back long, long time ago, and we kind of all knew these things, but throughout time with our manipulation of our social structures and keeping us divided, we have lost a lot of our given our gifts that are naturally ours. 
and in our DNA and have been suppressed by different fractions around us that want to keep us like puppets under control. Tell me more about the way you communicate with them. They, they use a group of grays. I've always had the same three. And I realized quickly that everybody that is a contactee, I, and the reason I know this is because my son, oldest son, I have two sons, both have had experience, but the oldest son is really in tune and has a lot of experiences like I do. And I found out quickly that we don't have the same escort or he has his own group that three, like these, the ones that come from me, I know that they are a, a gray hybrid and they were designed by the interdimensionals and the tall grays. They designed these um, hybrids to, they're not a hybrid of a human, by the way, they are just a hybrid of the grays that they constructed. And they created these um, hybrid beings and it's tweaked to their DNA. Uh, interdimensionals and tall grays have a problem with the density on earth. It's not as easily for them to come down and do the things that they want to do. So they created these hybrid race and they do the legwork for them. They're the ones that come down. There's three, they travel in three and they, the same three, the female grade that I call my ET mother or my ET guardian or escort, I always have her. And so when my son and I were on a trip to Mexico that the interdimensionals orchestrated the whole thing, um, found out very quickly that the ones that come for him are not the same ones that come for me. Because when they came for him, I was very aware of their presence and I raised up. And they came to me and I realized it was not the ones I was familiar with. It's a different vibrational feeling to me. And they not pushed, but nudged me down and said, this is not about you and tapped me out. And I, I went to sleep. And so my son went with them and he had his experiences and we don't have experiences exactly at the same time, but we're aware when each other are having them. So vice versa, when they come for me, if he's trying to get up and be a part of it, they will put him in a paralysis state or they will tell him when he realizes, like I do, that there's different beings coming for different reasons, then they probably won't put him in a paralyzed state. But right now he's still at, they're putting him at a paralyzed state to where he can't speak or move. So Anyway, go ahead and ask me. I know I kind of got off on some other stuff. So go ahead and ask me again what you wanted to know. Yes. Um, so the communication is uh, telepathy. Or do they use yes. their vocal cords? Do they have vocal cords? Do they articulate no. themselves? No. It's te telepathic. Yes. Yeah. And you talked about a gray female. Yes. So how can you differ between male and female with the grays? It's a bond. It is a bond. I have a bond with her. And it's a motherly nurturing bond. It's a frequency. I don't know how to explain to you because we are at such a low frequency that if you, when you come in contact with someone at a very high frequency, you know, immediately something's different and it's not a feeling that you have here on earth at all. So I know because I just have that feeling, her frequency, she is motherly to me. And we s sit and play with each other's fingers whenever we're standing, like, in, you know, standing up, waiting to go. You know, we are, it's it's just a beautiful experience. Um, so one thing about, it is telepathic, but I will say this, that when I, I get messages here and I get, you know, in my dream state, I get lots of messages and, and knowledge. But when she is with me physically and we're communicating, I can't say that that there's a difference between male, female message or there's and there's not any inflection in her messages or from any of the rest of the grades. But I think pretty much I just it's her. The other two, 
I really don't know what their purpose is. It's her that I'm bonded with and interact with. But now when I get on craft, the telepathic messages that I get from the humanoids, the tall grays, and these other beings, I can tell in my in my mind, I can tell whether it's female or male, and I can sense inflection in their messages. Like it, it could be playful or it could be stern or it could be, I can sense inflection when I'm on craft and, and around the higher dimensional beings. Mm-hmm. Interesting. I know it's about a spiritual message also. So please don't mind me asking a few barbaric questions. I'm a nuts and bolts guy and I want to know what it looks like inside a craft and how does it feel if you touch something and how does the craft itself look like? To me, the craft is very bright. There are no physical lights, no physical lighting. Like, you know, we use lamps or, you know, the ceiling lights and things. There's nothing like that. Everything is lit. Where the light is coming from, I have no clue. I have no clue. But everything is bright. And everything, to me, appeared white. White, bright, sterile. Um, and I do touch things a lot. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I, also, I know that there's always a group of peers watching me. They are always a group of peers watching me and evaluating me on my mental health, my spiritual growth, my intellectual growth. How am I, you know, keeping with my mental health to make sure that how am I balancing between my experiences and my human life? Because they want me to understand and experience both and become comfortable. And it took me a long time to get to this point, but I am. And I finally am, and but it it didn't happen overnight. But it, as far as the craft, um, when the the grays feel like a dolphin, they feel a little bit cold. Uh, humanoids, they feel pretty much like us, maybe a little more, uh, a little more, a last. A, when I say, I hope I get this correct, like. A little more elastin in their skin like I don't know they, they just feel a little more healthier I guess or more like a dolphin I guess but not completely like a dolphin but um and as far as the inside I don't ever remember it being cold or hot or or you know it's just perfect <laughs> And the lighting is just bright. And I, like I said, I have no clue. And I, I do know this when, like, when, when I'm being transported to a craft from the outside, the craft just seems like, oh, you know, just a regular size craft. But when you walk into the craft, it is humongous. It is humongous. So, yes. So, Their technology, they are million years ahead of us. So their technology is so far ahead of us. There's nothing to compare it to. How we travel does not apply to them. Our physics does not apply to them. The way that we look at God and and that does not apply to them. I will say, and people need to know this, they believe in a creator source. Creator source created everything everywhere and they, they all have souls. So that's something that needs to be cleared up because a lot of people say, you know, that they're demons and whatever, even the ones that are negative towards humanity, they're not demonic. They just don't like humans and don't want humans to evolve and become galactic human beings. Um, because we have so much potential and, and so many things are suppressed that we that will will occur during our ascension and with tweaking of our DNA from the positive extraterrestrials and interdimensionals and we will become so much more than what these lower 
dimension or lower extraterrestrials, they are locked into our solar system. So they have worked with factions of our government or factions of our government and with these uh, elite Illuminati or cabal, these these groups that control the world, um, they do not want us to ascend. They do not want us to have contact with interdimensionals or positive ETs because they have they have controlled us for a long time, over a hundred years. I don't even know exactly how far back it goes, but they keep us in constant turmoil. This is what causes wars. This is what causes separation of religions, separations of um, language, separations of, of, you know, racism. All these things have been thrown at us intentionally to keep us from evolving into the true beings that we are potentially and are going to become because the interdimensional and the positive ETs are here. They are here. Once they got into our solar system, and this has been a while back, I'll just throw a year out there around 2020, they started coming in and a message was given to all these negative uh, beings, uh, 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 one race of reptilians, uh, one race of grace, and some races of other humanoid, humanoid looking races. They were told to get out of here, and a lot of them left. And I've seen um, video footage um, from the ISS showing all these different craft leaving Earth. And that's what that was all about. So some of them are still here, but they are on their last legs. And I think that if you really do your research and look, you don't hear about people being abducted like they were there for a long time. Um, like I, I, within this year or really since 2020, you don't really hear of any new abduction stories. Most of these stories are from the past because when they got into the solar system, the message was put out, get out of the way, leave humanity alone. We are here to help them. Um, since you said abductions, you challenged the popular notion of abductions. I prefer to refer to these experiences as enlightened contacts. Can you give us insights into specific encounters that have led you to redefine these experiences since it's okay. an abduction, though? One thing I want to clear up is that of the Greys, they have a bad reputation, kind of like I was talking about that man from Mexico. Um, but there is there are over 60 different types of Greys. I don't even know the exact number, but there's many different types. One race, and I think they are from Orion, could be wrong about that. I do not know everything, but that's what I perceived. And they are a group of grays that have made some kind of agreements possibly with governments. And this was part of their hybrid program. I've never been a part of that. I do believe that these people are have real stories and they're telling the truth because I know that that one race of grays and I know that the cabal, the elite, black hats, whatever you want to call all these uh, people that have manipulated and control our governments and our politics and stuff uh, want to keep us dumbed down because they are locked into the solar system. And once we go through our extension and once we are, become more intelligent and all these things are happening as we speak right now, we have the potential to become interdimensional and, and travel outside and go far into, we can go outside our solar system. We have the capability to do this. And our because of the foods, the air, the water, everything has toxins in it. And uh, extraterrestrials and interdimensionals would not drink our water. They would not eat our food. So these cattle mutilations that you hear about, they would have no need for that. They do not, they would not touch our food. Our cattle and stuff 
are pumped up with all these antibodies and all these chem drugs and stuff. They would not touch anything like that. There is no need. Um, so it, even the grays, they do not eat like we eat. They make a nutrient that is like a paste, which is nutrients, and they rub it into their skin and it, it is absorbed and they excrete their waste through their skin. So even the negative grays would have no need to do these things. So I think that is just a fraction of government or elite that want to keep us in fear, use these things to keep us in fear and to keep us apart and, you know, scared. They Their main goal was to, when they, they've always known that the positive and the interdimensionals were coming once humanity reached a certain point, certain point of intelligence. And so we are finally at that point. We are at a peak point where we are intelligent to understand they are not gods. They are simply beings that are way ahead of us in evolution. They are their technology is way ahead of us. And they we are smart enough to understand that when they tell us that everything here is alive and that plants and trees and all these things are living beings, even our science and technology today tells us that they believe that our plants and our trees are living beings. So we are intelligent enough to understand the things that they can help us with to become better. In our 3D world, we don't see the trees communicating and things together at this point. Even animals communicate. Everything, we are connected to everything. And we don't understand that because we have been purposely separated, disconnected. But as we evolve and become more aware and, and enlightened and learn to eat and live better, we will start to see things around us. There's things happening around us right now that we don't even see. There could be an extraterrestrial craft parked right in here in my living room or right in the room with you, and you would never see or know it. But at some point, we are going to evolve and start to see and understand these things. So that's our main reason why they are here at this point in our life, because we are ready as a human species to evolve further. We are playing with weapons and technology that could simply wipe us out. And not only that, the and what the positive and the interdimensionals want us to understand, there's more to this planet, more to the universe than just us. There's more beings in the universe, okay? And here on Earth, we're playing with technology that is destructive to not only ourselves, but to nature and everything that lives and thrives on this planet. So when we do these things, why do you think anybody that was a million years ahead of us would let these two governments with two leaders decide to wipe out all of the innocent animals, all of the trees, everything that's beautiful about our world that we take for granted, our planet that we take for granted. Why do they have to suffer? Why do all the innocent bystanders, all the indigenous people that know nothing of this technology or that we're even in a war? So they're looking at it from a overall perspective that we take for granted. We are not, everything is not about us human beings. We are a small, minute part of something they love about planet Earth. They love everything and they're not going to let us destroy it. And we are playing with weapons, atomic bombs, all these things. And, and now we are venturing out into space. Next, uh, they want to put fear in here because if they can get humanity to think, oh, we've got this horrible invasion coming from these uh, extraterrestrials, we've got to pump up our weapons and we've got to put these nuclear weapons up in space, they are not going to let us do that. 
no way. They're not going to let us do that. Because when we do these things, even on our planet, it ripples out into the universe. They are not going to allow this. And I think you've heard stories where they've come down and closed down all these nuclear power plants. And that was, hey, we're letting you know, stop doing this. You're, you're playing with something that you don't truly understand what it will do to everything in this planet. So, yes. I may have another reason to think so, but I also do not think that humans will conquer interstellar space anytime soon. I'm not sure. I really Some don't. people believe we're already out there and that we've already done these things. I have no way of knowing one way or another. I, I do know that we have a lot of technology has been suppressed and it was given for, given to governments in trade for certain things. And if the right beings or the right people had been in place, it should have been given to humanity. We should not have proper poverty. We should not have, suffer from diseases. Uh, we should not be paying for using fossil fuels. I mean, we have technology that's sitting unused because of these powerful people that control us and keep us like puppets and make all this money off of us. They cannot make money off a healthy race of humanity. They make money off of a sick humanity. So this is all done, not in our best interest. And this is why the positive extraterrestrials and interdimensionals are here. We are smart enough to realize that we have been fooled for a very long time. And all these proofs need to come to surface. And we will have assistance from them to be better. And as far as, you know, like I have no proof whether, you know, what we've done as far as intercellular travel or anything like that. But I do know they have the technology and they don't use fuels like we use fuels the way that they would go to the moon and the way that they go and the way we go it's two different ways. They don't use fuels. They can, um, well, for example, their craft is a living being. So their pilots are, their DNA is tweaking. So when they are born, they are designed to be a pilot. So a pilot and a craft consciousness collect, connect and nobody else can be a pilot but that pilot to that craft. That's why we've had to try to reverse these craft that we do have, however we got them. I don't know if they were gift. I don't know if it was a craft. I don't know. But I do know that we can't drive. We cannot use their craft because you have to be specifically designed to connect and your consciousness would meet. And, and telepathically, the pilot will tell the craft where he wants to go. And with the snap of a finger, they can go and it, they know how to change. They can go between dimensions and they can go all these different ways and they do not use the fuels. Interesting what you just told me. I was in another podcast with my podcast colleague. I was talking about, um, we're talking about something that is called black goo and you heard about it, I'm sure. And I've we, read about it. I, I, I don't, I mean, you know, I, I don't know a lot about it, to be honest. I, I, I do a lot of research and stuff. I have a website, then I have a Facebook group. And so I see these things come through. But go ahead. Yeah. Um, we were just speculating and uh, talking talking around uh, how Black Goo could form itself into an alien spaceship, into a craft, and be a spaceship and pilot at the same time. Hmm. So... When it it can take any, it can form into anything it it, it wants and needs yeah. to be. So it could be like it could be pilot and uh, craft at the same time. It's interesting what you just told me. It's yeah, it's it's it. I don't know so much about that, but I do know that I think you've seen probably from the crash at Roswell, and I do believe that that really happened. And we did gain a lot of technology from that. Fiber optics, Velcro, 
uh, night vision, stealth, uh, you know, invisible, like the stealth bomber being invisible on radars. I, I think we were able to get those things from that crash. But um, I don't know. It, you don't, you know, there's so much information and then there's, it's hard to know what's true and what's not true, you know, but I do know that, and I've seen pictures of this, of like the full, it looks like full and you take it and wad it up and then you open it up into your hand and it just goes right back into its structure. So anything is possible. The goo thing could be possible. I just really don't know about it. I mean, but I mean, they are so far ahead of us. It's hard for us to even perceive how these things can, can work, but they will help us with a lot of these things. I once saw a video where scientists, they put a drop, a little drop of water into a magnetic field and then they changed its shape uh, with frequencies. Yes. I've seen that. And it's, shaped in crazy things mm -hmm. into crazy things and i thought man this could be a way aliens uh... absolutely i mean it's just like with me they were changing my frequency frequency vibrational frequency consciousness all these things you see it everywhere now and this is what we are learning we are becoming more intelligent and we are becoming so aware of things that 10 years ago, you really didn't hear a lot about these things. So we are going through an extension and, and people say, well, how do we know? Well, the thing, the beauty part about this is that you really don't realize it. It's such a, such a gradual thing. It's not like a black and white or that you just automatically notice. Um, it's, it's so gradual that by the time you realize it, you don't even realize it, that you didn't see these things all along. I think frequency plays a big part in all that. Uh, I, I'm friends with this Austrian uh, researcher who, uh, who found a few years ago, he found in Austria, he found these maybe ancient resonance chambers and they're crazy. I can send you pictures of them. They are crazy. You can sit into this, uh, sit down in these chambers and uh, produce a tone, maybe with your voice or with an instrument, and it's coming from everywhere and it it uh, gets you in a strange mood, man. That's why I said um, frequencies can change your mood. It can not only change the type of uh, si uh, shape of something; it ch also can change your mood and maybe your consciousness or whatnot. So frequency. Is a it does. And, you know, that's that's the thing. I am now vibrating at a higher, higher frequency. And that's something that they have groomed me into. But I do know I can. That's one thing that I know I can do is that I can teach other people how to raise their frequency. And you'll you'll learn that you will outgrow negative thinking people you will outgrow watching all this negative news and media on tv you you will become to where you don't even like hearing it and what that is is as you as you become more positive and get into the right way of thinking you will outgrow all these things you know because a lot of our diseases and things are from like negative energies. And it, that's where these diseases and things find host is, you know, it's your weakest point. So as we evolve and we raise our frequency, and that's one thing that the positive extraterrestrials and interdimensionals are looking for is the overall frequency of our planet. And if we can help to raise the frequency of all of us and get us up on a higher frequency we will be happier live longer and we will they will see that we are a positive race and we will have face-to-face -face contact with them so with with my frequency and i know that there's other people like me i'm not the only one and i'm not special there's other people that have incarnated here for this very same reason from different races that are assisting us for this humanity humanity evolution so to speak 
um, and, you know, and that's one reason why I want to do this is I want to get to know these people that, that have, that are experiencing what I have. And we will be able to help raise humanity's frequency by teaching people to think more positive and things of this nature, which is not a hard thing to do. It's just a different way of thinking. Let's talk about your platform, timefordisclosure.com. It promotes an open dialogue about extraterrestrial interactions. So what challenges uh, challenges do you expect to face in bringing the bridging, the uh, gap between government knowledge and public awareness? Well, a lot of people have a closed mind because of their upbringing, you know. So... These things don't happen overnight. And they've always told me this is not going to be easy. And basically, if I bring up the topic, I can tell quickly who is interested and who is not. And I firmly believe you can lead a horse to water, but you cannot make him drink it. So it's pointless. It's pointless to try to, to debate someone and because everybody's on their own spiritual path. Everybody needs to find their own way. Um, it's, it's, it's part of the process, and that's part of the beauty of it, you know, is to let people have a, and find an interest or start seeking information and do it on their own. Nothing can be forced upon humanity. It needs to be done in the proper way. And so basically... Is we can introduce these ideas, but it's up to them to decide what they want to, how far they want to take and learn and educate themselves about it. So you can't force humanity to do something they're not ready. And I know this, but I, you know, I, I am not giving up on humanity and neither are they. It just takes time. This does not happen overnight. So it takes a lot of patience. And sometimes, you know, It could be a waste of my breath, but that's okay. I, I did what I'm supposed to do. And, you know, everyone's given the opportunity to, to try to be a better human being. You already told me that your work at the Department of Defense was just a uh, part or, 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 yeah, something that you did. But do you sometimes think that your work at the Department of Defense maybe unintentionally uh, prepared you for your current role as a major voice. Absolutely. Yeah. Everything in my life has been orchestrated by the interdimensionals. Relationships, whether they flourished or failed, and, it, you know, they flourished and then they failed. So all of these things, I realize now, everything was by intention and was something that I needed to experience here. All of us are here. Being a human being is a very short experience compared to all the other beings in the universe. So this is a school. We are all here learning and experiencing things. And I, for one, I've learned from the positive and the interdimensionals is that we have a soul and we have a consciousness. And when we We are all in a vessel, a costume, human costume. But when you take this costume off, we are all energy beings. We are all alike. We are no different than one another. We are all connected. So when we finish in this lifetime, yes, this body stays here, but our soul and our consciousness go up to creator source. Once we get to creator source, then it is decided between creator source and a group of elders up there that are of higher dimensions on what what course you take next, what experience you experience next. Some people may need to come back and, and experience the human experience again. And some people do this over and over again. Some people, and they all come to an agreement upstairs that, uh, that you know, you can try a different You know, you might want to come back as a dog. You might want to come back as a dolphin. You might want to experience being an extraterrestrial. Or you could be at a point where you've experienced these things and 
you know, everybody is in agreement that you've experienced everything that you wanted to experience. And you can stay in your etheric, non-physical form and be an energy being. And that's really up in the, I'd say, the highest dimension, which is right up there near creator source. Interesting. So with all the knowledge you gathered over the years and with all that you experienced, what is your opinion on um, things like paranormal, the paranormal or maybe cryptids like Bigfoot and uh, some, some compared to um, with UFO sightings and, and stuff? They, like are, they are real. Um, I was actually a observer the gray uh, my escorts took me to a craft and we got on and there were some humans on there and I talked to them and there were some beings that I'd never seen before and so I was asking around like what is this and so basically what was happening is that I was on a mission with a group of interdimensionals and positive ETs And they were looking for creatures. And at the time, I didn't understand really what cryptid was. I didn't know what it was. But I knew that we were looking for these type creatures. Some look like animals, different creatures that were in the wrong dimension. However they got there, I do not know. But they had jumped down from a dimension and was in the wrong place. So basically with this group of explorers, They were looking for these cryptids, creatures, and collecting them and then taking them back to where they belong. Because being in the wrong dimension, it was creating havoc and they weren't supposed to be there. So they were, so these things are real. And I've, I've actually seen a ghost um, only one time. And I saw that when I was uh, working at Fort Benning, Georgia. Uh, And I was living off post and I was really close to a civil war battlefield. And I was outside and it had just gotten dark and I was sitting outside and had my German shepherd dog with me and my dog and I were sitting there and it appeared to be a Confederate soldier. And he had, a, I don't know if I'm getting the terminology right, but he had a gun over his shoulder that had the sword. I think it's called a bayonet. I'm not sure. And he had like a little silver bucket pail that was swinging back and forth that like a little bucket. And I don't know, maybe he carried his lunch. Maybe he, I don't know what was in it, but it was swagging back and forth. And he was just walking along the back field. And I just sit there. I wasn't scared. And my dog wasn't scared. And my dog did not bark. We just sit there. And he took no notice of us. And we watched him until he got so far away, it was behind trees. And so when that happened, I walked out into the yard to see if I could see him. But we couldn't. He disappeared. So I know that these things are real and they happen. Now, I don't know if that's like tears and timelines or it's for ghosts. I, 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 I don't really understand enough about that. Um, I, I know that it's real. I, I've personally, I've seen it. So I know that it is real. Very interesting. So before we come to an end today, maybe let people know where they can find you if people want to get in contact with you or tell your the story. Yes. Um, I have a website and it's called Time for Disclosure. And I have some articles about some of my experiences and I plan to do more. Um, and I'm also any podcast that I do, I love to put those on there because every host ask different questions so it you know it brings out a little bit more information that i can share with humanity so uh and i also have a facebook group called time for disclosure slash we have never been alone and i truly believe that we have never been alone and it's also we are the disclosure people like me the experiencers we are the disclosure And we are not recognized really by the government or anything, but we are the people that really know what it's like and, 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 and know the good from the bad and the differences in the agendas. 
So we play an important role, even though we're not recognized. A great quote to end this episode, Nancy. Thank you so much for being my guest tonight. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. Please stay with me for two more minutes, okay? Yes. 